investigating the murder of a local resident. Were there any ongoing disputes with anyone at all? Disputes? You know what folk are saying. Someone's targeting striking miners. It just feels like everything's changing. Yeah. <laughs> because it is, Andy. I know the potential to inflame divisions in the community. This place remembers. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Dave Jorgensen, senior video producer and TikTok guy here at The Post. Today we're going to talk about the crime series Sherwood. Joining me now are the show's creator, James Graham, and lead actor, David Morrissey. James and David, welcome to Washington Post Live. Hi, how are you doing? Thanks for joining me. So a quick note to our audience before we get started, we want to hear from you. So if you have any questions for our guests, please tweet us at the handle Post Live. That's at Post Live at P-O-S-T-L-I-V-E. Okay, let's get started. James. This series has been a hit in the UK this summer, and now it's debuted in the US on the streaming service BritBox. It's basically everywhere at this point, but it takes place in a very small place, a mining village where you grew up. Can you tell me more about the true events that inspired Sherwood and why now is the right moment to tell this story? Yeah, sure. No, nice to speak about it. It's um, yeah, so it's set in my uh, hometown in North Nottinghamshire, which is uh, a socially, economically deprived part of England. It's where um, the you know industry and manufacture used to play a key part in people's lives, but since then has deteriorated due to the the um, various government policies over the years. And as many people will know, in uh, in 1984, uh, um, there was a huge, uh, the Britain's largest actually piece of industrial action, the largest strike ever in the UK, which was the miners' strike, uh, which was against the policies of Margaret Thatcher closing down the state-subsidised pits and collieries. Um, and uh, you may have seen that represented culturally in films like Billy Elliot and that kind of thing. Um, but actually, what's the untold story, I think, of this is, is it was more split than you might imagine. And in, in my hometown in Nottinghamshire, uh, more people stayed working than actually went on strike. And pre-Brexit, pre the European referendum, where we were all divided into this artificial binary of leave and remain, uh, this, this decision completely split families and friendship groups. It was incredibly violent. And the London Metropolitan Police had to come up uh, for about a year and police these communities and it's very upsetting. Um, cut to 2004 uh, and there was a really tragic murder on my uncle's, uncle's street a few doors down from me um, where a, a miner who had been on strike was killed by a miner who had chosen to go back to work. And this, uh, it was done uh, with a crossbow, a bow and arrow. So all the mythology and the folklore around uh, Robin Hood being an outlaw with a bow and arrow uh, was all was is all there. He went into Sherwood Forest, uh, and because that search area was so huge, um, the Met Police had to come back to this very tiny village uh, decades after the miners' strike. And what that did was invoke all those memories and that shared trauma in the community around that political decision that split it in the first place. So it's a it's a crime drama that we're, re we're representing, but it's the political and social narratives that I think interested me the most. Yeah, and something else you talked about in an interview uh, regarding the show is how people, even decades later, if they saw someone, they crossed the street. If that person was on the other side of the, of the strike. So that was fascinating to me. We're going to get more into that later. But David, I want to talk about your role as Detective she, uh, Chief Superintendent Ian Sinclair, not to be confused with Sinclair. Uh, he's leading the murder investigation, and we have a clip of him talking about the town's relationship with the police. So let's take a look at that first. Anyway. Yes, I was head of this operation, but the success was down to my team. They worked tirelessly to get these criminals off our streets. Now, we all know that um, policing requires the cooperation of the public. We need the, their faith, support. And we find ourselves not in a particularly good place in that regard at the moment. And some might say with good reason. The tradition is that we police by consent, and if we lose the consent of the people, well, now we have a long way to go to earn back some of that trust. Thank you very much. David, one thing I appreciate about your character in this scene is sort of a, a self-awareness of the tension towards the police. Can you talk a little bit about more where that stems from? Yeah, well, not long before our drama started, um, Nottingham was in a particularly 
violent phase of its history. There was, uh, it was actually um, the nickname for it was Shottingham because there was a lot of uh, gun crime. And that scene there is uh, uh, Ian has being rewarded for the work he's done on that particular investigation. But he's, he's very aware because he's a man from those streets. He hasn't been drafted in in any way. He grew up in that community. He's a man very aware of the history of the, those streets, the history of those communities. His father was a miner himself, so he grew up in a mining community and chose a different path. He chose the police, as and so did his brother. So, you know, he's a very alive to the history of what goes on and also the police's responsibility to the community themselves. You know, obviously modern policing uh, entails a lot of sort of online crime now. And, you know, there's a lot of times when they're not on the beat, they're not in the communities themselves. But he believes in the in the contract, in the public contract, that the police govern by consent of the people, that they're there for those people, not to be against them, but to be for them. And uh, he wants to place his him and his own police force right in the heart of his his local community. He believes in that very strongly. Uh, and then this terrible crime happens, as James was just describing. And Ian is very, very conscious that this could really open up a lot of old wounds in that community and that those old wounds could spiral to a much larger conflict amongst the people who live in those streets. Let's let's get deeper into those wounds. Um, James, I want to talk about the miners, a term as perhaps an ignorant American I was not as familiar with, uh, scab. When I was watching that, I had to play it back to the scab was. Uh, can you explain to me the issues between the scabs and the strikers and the history there? Yeah, I think I don't, I don't think you're alone there, actually. I think I, certainly even even a younger generation in the UK uh, have never even heard of that, that terminology before. But it was certainly widely used in the 1980s. And it was to determine those people who decided to go back to work, um, dissent from the union and uh, and cross a picket line. And that picket line was a real physical thing. So those who were those miners who were striking. And I think you have to remember that in, in the UK in 1980s, that was about it was several hundred thousand people who worked uh, in the coal industry at that time. And so these were, you know, the tens and tens of thousands of people uh, picketing every single day across the UK, trying to stop workers going into the, to the pit. And that often meant that sometimes you would find yourself opposite your dad or your brother or your old friend and they had chosen to go to work and you had chosen to stay out. And if you chose to stay out, that was, uh, you know, that went on for about a year. You had no wage, you had no salary. Uh, you, you were completely economically um, devastated. So the resentment that I think built up to those who made the choice to continue working was very profound. And as you said at the very beginning, that's still to my shock as, a, as someone who just turned 40. Um, to my shock, people in my community still won't speak to people who made a different choice uh, uh, back in 84, different part of the pub you sit in, cross the street if you see them. And, uh, and so, so as David described, uh, you can imagine um, the, the fear that the police had when a murder happened within a community like this, where there is such a difficult relationship to the police. And we can talk about that more if you like, because I, I do think that speaks to the the existential crisis that both your nation and our nation currently has with its police force um, over what that contract is. It was the potential for flare was was huge. And um, and it, it's how it's how David's character, Ian and the rest of them navigate their way through the tension. So for me, again, as a writer, it wasn't just about doing a procedural crime drama or even a thriller. And there were all those thriller elements in it. You have a guy, an armed killer in the woods uh, who is tormenting and torturing a community uh, and you have more than one killing it should be said um, but to me yes it was it was all the stuff you're talking about about um, the relationship to institutions and power in the police yeah and one thing that I appreciate right at the the beginning of the very first episode and throughout is there is just a sense of history we're not getting all the information just yet but there's little pieces that you're you're clearly showing some tension amongst the characters that start to unravel as we learn more and more about them. And I, my producer tells me that I need to learn my history more because apparently it's a young American thing as well and that older Americans probably are more aware of scabs. 
time. So right. I'll do my little history lesson after this one. Uh, now, I do. let's talk, as you said, more about the police officers in this. David, I read that you met the actual officer who investigated the Sherwood murders. How did exploring the minor strike from a police officer's perspective inform your preparation to play Ian Sinclair? Yes, I did. I met the officer who was in charge of this investigation. I met lots of police officers, actually. I met police officers who were still serving police officers and officers who have now left the force. Uh, and that was quite interesting, the, uh, the difference between their memories of what went on. Um, but also I met a lot of man miners. I, let, I met a lot of miners who had been there during the during the strike and their opinion of the police. And there seemed to me to be, you know, an understanding of all sides about how difficult it was. What happened was, and I think James alluded to it, was that there was policemen from the community, people like Ian, who he would know the people on the other side of that picket line. He would have grown up with them. He knew them from school. He knew them from the streets he grew up in. So there was a, Although it wasn't peaceful, you know, there would be skirmishes, but they knew each other and it wasn't um, unheard of that they would stand on the picket line in the day, but then go to the pub with the same people in the evening. The difference was that it became such a difficult thing to police and a manpower problem that police forces were drafted in from other parts of the UK, uh, particularly from London and the Metropolitan Police who had no, uh, no relationship with the people on the other side. And they, was also, they were also given a remit by the government at the time to, to go in, to, to you know, go in there heavy handed. And so that's where a lot of the lasting scars, lasting schisms came from, was the brutality that happened when other police forces came into that region. And Ian, in our present day story, is told that officers are going to have to come into that region again. And that's where his panic and his real concern starts to, to grow when he knows that other police forces are going to have to come into this region and police it. And he finds that really dangerous, given, given the history of what happened during those times. Yeah. And, you know, difficult for, for that character, for police officers. And I think for James, speaking of difficulty, I feel like creating the show and it's inspired on, by true events, but they're not quite exactly what happened, of course. So can you tell me more about the responsibility there and the difficulty of, of making the show, but again, not fully based on the true events? Yeah, I mean, it was difficult, but then it should be difficult because it's not my personal tragedy and this is, this, this is real people's trauma. Um, so yeah, we, I, I made the decision... Um, having spoken to some of the real people involved, including the police officers that David spoke to and the the family who are inspired by the the um the first killing of the of the striking minor, their their father, it felt I, I've done a lot of real life stories and put real people on stage and screen, including things like The Crown, where you're dealing with the Queen and, you know, very familiar people. But because these are private individuals and their their tragedy felt quite private. And because I was a neighbour, this is my t this is my town, my family. I can't I can't actually imagine. Maybe you you know one, but I can't imagine other examples where the writer of a of a true crime story was in the village at the time and lived a few streets away. I can't think of one. <laughs> I can't think yeah. of one. Um, so, uh, so I felt that very keenly, and and, and uh, so the choice actually. I, mean, I know. Well, I'm actually making it sound too worthy because obviously the other choice you have to make as a creative. Is that you also do want the freedom to investigate all the things that really interested me so i wanted to manufacture as david mentioned i wanted to manufacture a police relationship uh between uh, a, 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 a police detective and um his father who was a minor and, and 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 the shame that he feels over having picked a different path and that being drawn up by this crime um you want the freedom to get to a different kind of truth and also not uh, hurt and no one goes into this to hurt or cause pain. I didn't want to uh, cause extra pain to the people who are involved. So we took the core essence of this story, uh, multiple killings in a mining community where there were divisions and the re-arrival decades later of the Metropolitan Police, like David said, created danger there. That's the that's the kernel of it. And and um, outlaws in Sherwood Forest who are armed and dangerous. And th then the rest was, um, yeah, these are my characters. These are my families. I've, I've invented them in order to explore the issues and the themes that I wanted to do and to distance it from the real people who I grew to care about and wanted them to not be too uh, re-traumatized by it. 
And part of that exploration uh, is the different perspectives, I think, of all. So, you know, critics have talked about uh, and they praise that you we see the miners, the police and even the killers. It, that's they're all blending together in a certain way. How did you decide to do that? Was that part of, um, I don't know, elaborate on the truth or can you tell me a little bit more about that and your decision to blend these storylines? I just think that's the main, that's the superpower of drama. It, 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 it's unlike uh, no disrespect to journalism or any any other um, uh, trade that, uh, that tries to interrogate what the hell is happening in the world. Um, the value, I think, always of drama, whether on stage or screen, is empathy. It, it literally forces an audience to walk in the shoes or the, the footsteps of someone you might politically disagree with. And in both our cultures at the moment, we are living through incredibly polarized and extreme times. And this was almost like a microcosm of that, 1984, the minor strike, and then what happened in these murders decades later. In one little community, you have these polarized extremes, these factions and divides, which acts as a kind of, I guess, a metaphor for everything that's happening in, in the West at the moment in terms of our inability to, um, to, to meet each other or agree with each other or, or listen and hear each other's points of view. Um, understandably, because the people, this was people's lives and, and, and it was very, very, very painful. So I guess I, I, am, I am conscious as a writer of, of trying to humanize all points of view and not just in a sit on the fence centrist way. I just think that's the value of it. And actually the, you know, the joy of it is how complicated and messy and difficult this stuff is and the, the condition and the, that the, the, these characters were were placed in, and it actually also felt like a, a privilege. Um, I don't to 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 put to to give, to give voice to the infinitely more difficult um, argument of those who went back to work. I, I don't know what it's like over there, but certainly in our culture, I'm, David, I'm sure you agree that, that it's just there was just less understanding or familiarity with the arguments for the tens of thousands of miners who chose to work um and didn't stay out and you know the romance of striking uh is un easily understood and the pain of striking is easy easily understood you're denying yourself something for a greater cause i think to just to find a language for those people who made a different decision which was the majority of people in my village felt great and then looking to all the stuff about masculinity and shame and how much of our, our working class identity is based on our politics or our job or our, uh, our ability to provide for our families and all that stuff. So yeah, that, that all felt in there. Yeah, and I that self-awareness too is, is in there. I think there's even a line from David's character about let's not call this the Robin Hood. Let's, let's not give the media something to peg this to. And I, I, I appreciated that sort of like almost speaking to the camera, like, no, this is not what this is about. We don't want it to become that. So uh, that was a really interesting uh, device within all that. Um, David, speaking more on your character, can you explain what spy cops are and their legacy at Not Shirt? Yeah, so uh, what happens during the course of our story is that Ian discovers that inside the community during that time, 1984, uh, the government would have put in I guess you would call undercover officers, uh, people who were there to spy on the community, to also, you know, feedback information to the police and um, MI5, I guess. But, you know, they're, they're police tactics that have often been used with organized crime, terrorist organizations. But this was amongst people who, you know, were either striking minors, they were, they were, people who had every right to their privacy. They were not um, uh, agents against the state. And he discovers this in our present story. But also what he discovers is that one of these spy cops, um, and there were quite a few employed in that operation, but one of them may or may not have stayed in the community. And so he has to now look at the community in a different way because he believes that someone who would have been sending information back uh, during that time and actually probably um, you know creating more division or helping to create more division in that community is still around and he believes that the, our killer knows that information and so there could be an imminent target for this man's um, you know, for, for his murderous intent. 
And so he's suddenly got a time clock on him that he's got to find this person. But he's also got personal reasons to find him as well. What I love about James's work is it is, you know, there's the political in the bit with the big capital P, but there's political with the personal politics as well, that people are going through their personal um, fights and, and politicism that is happening right in front of them. And it's important that, you know, instead of having the condemnation of a soundbite, which happens, seems to be happening a lot in our world, that we see the complexity and understand the difficulties and the reasons for people making their decisions in their life, whether it's to feed their family or whether it's to protect themselves or whatever. But, you know, it's listening and understanding with comprehension rather than just the, uh, the soundbite that we tend to get now. Well, you know, I think there's also some acting with a capital A from you. And speaking of listening, when I was watching your character, there's so much going on, especially in that first episode, that you're clearly uh, taking it all in. And we kind of just, we, there's just a lot of shots of you just looking and, and there's so much going on. Can you tell me about the process of of building this character and his world and how what you were thinking about in those scenes uh, to help kind of, you know, get the audience behind this this police officer? Uh, well, first and foremost, it always starts with the script. I mean, you know, you think of the script as just the lines on the page, but it's also the bits within the lines as well. So, you know, you work on what James has given you and it was such gold. But also our two directors, we had Lewis Arnold and Ben A. Williams, who are our directors, you would talk to them. But then also what I would do is I would meet people from that time. I would meet a lot of people who lived, lived there. I grew up in the north of England. I grew up in Liverpool. So my city it was a very binary argument we were very for the miners and against thatcher whereas uh, the drama that james has written, written is a much more nuanced world it was a world i was not aware of like you i was not i did not really comprehend what it must have been like for miners who went back to work who stayed in work i i hadn't that had never been on my radar so i had to go and discover that and ian is a character who carries a lot of he like community history and, and uh, the history of his country, but he carries a lot of personal history. So things that might mean something just in pure terms of the investigation, he's also thinking of them in terms of his own personal development, his own life, the decisions he's made in his life. And what this present day story is uncovering is making him examine his own life every minute because he's walking the streets that he grew up as a kid, the, the streets he grazed his knee on as a kid, the streets he grew, played football in. You know, he's looking at it through those that child's eyes and remembering what it was like and what he's lost and sacrificed during that time because of the events that he, he's having to re-examine now. So it's very loaded stuff. It is loaded. Uh, and speaking of loaded and things that James James has written, he wrote a great script. James, you also wrote an op-ed for The Guardian, and you said you wrote Sherwood as a warning. I, I know you were kind of already talking about the polarization and everything a few minutes ago, but what did you mean by this being a warning? I think um, essentially what, you, without reducing all the complexities, as David discusses, of what the minor strike was on a very human level, and actually, as you sort of in, in, intimated, the drama doesn't really make, take any viewpoint on even the economic rightness or wrongness of of, of the Thatcher government um, employing the policies of the time that were very much happening under Reagan as well of reducing the state and yeah. and closing uh, loss making industries that employed hundreds of thousands of people. It it I suppose it, the one stand it does take is whoever what whoever whoever was to blame or whatever the right or wrong decisions behind that policy were um, the victims were the were people from across the country in places like my community and what was unforgivable was the the way that they were abandoned and and, and left behind without any reinvestment and then the more i got into it the more um talking uh, as david did about this as about spy cops and the ways in which um the police and the security services and the government intentionally inserted uh, Asian provocateurs almost and divisive elements into these communities in order to split them because it was the splitting of them that would mean that the government would win and that the uh, the U trade unions would lose. I found that so um, upsetting and compelling and new actually a new way of looking at it. Um, um, but that wasn't your question. Sorry, I went on off a tangent. Your question about the polarization. Yeah, uh, which was, um, that's fine. Uh, it was a good tangent. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I want to do it. Um, but yes, um, polarization. I think I, you know, it's, it, you'll you'll know infinitely more than I will about what is happening today in our in our political discourse in the US and the UK, and and um, how there will always be natural uh, differences of opinion on on social, political, economic, cultural um, questions. What I find, uh, again, unforgiving and worrying and, and frustrating is the ways that uh, different parties or governments will weaponize um, those divisions uh, and, and, uh, and exacerbate them for short term political gain, whether that's dividing us into these groups of concern and saying you should you should be blaming them and you should be blaming them. Uh, so the the the. Um, the multitude of strikes that have re-emerged in the UK over the past few months, which I sometimes worry that me and David and our drama manifested by just talking about them again. Um, but I don't think that's on you all. <laughs> I take some credit for it, but yeah, there's uh, it's it's yeah, it's, you know, it's things are happening that you know uh, that we have the rail strikers and barristers. It's not just a working class thing; it's middle class professionals. And possibly our, uh, the biggest nurse strike in the NHS that might take place over the winter. So, some a, a mood, a philosophy, uh, an attitude, a spirit is re is being reawakened. Um, but yes, I, I fundamentally think that what what unites the UK and the US is the is the shameful sometimes um, decision by governing parties uh, to see tensions, see divisions and go right into the heart of it and exacerbate those. Uh, and whether or not people believe or don't believe that Joe Biden is sincere when he says he wants to be a unifying force. Um, that is what I think we all need, we all need whether it's effective or not. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's much harder to choose to unite people than it is to divide us into categories and have us fighting amongst ourselves. Well, I'm curious too if if you'll explore these themes more because you just got renewed for a second season. Congratulations! And uh, well, I'm curious. One, will that exist in the similar world? Will David be there? Uh, will you look more into the this polarization? What what's uh, what's going on there? Yeah, well, David, I spoke a few weeks ago about what uh, and David isn't giving himself anywhere near enough credit uh, for how much he himself sort of loaded, as you said. Uh, the character and the world with some of these stories. I, we both come from working in theatre a lot and I think that collaborative nature of building a world and the characters is why I really love and value as a, as a dramatist as opposed to a novelist working with human beings. So um, um, so yeah, both David and I have been speaking about potential for what that second series might be without having a light on the answers yet. But unfortunately, as you may have noticed, uh, it is not a quiet time politically in Britain at the moment and there is plenty to talk about um and i suppose what i'm interested in is is the vulnerabilities where we're vulnerable as a society for those tensions and divisions that we saw in the 1980s to re-emerge and i'm, I'm, I'm convinced it's around the area of, of, of economic deprivation and poverty um which is coming down the tracks very urgently certainly in the uk over, en over energy price bills and the cutting of the state and welfare and everything else so crime and the combustibility that comes with crime um, may return to Nottinghamshire uh, like the bad old, old days. And I think somewhere in that will be a story for, for our characters. I look forward to it. And David, with that return to Nottinghamshire, will, what, what do you want your character to do? How would you like him to develop? Do you have any personal thoughts that you want to put out into the world that you can manifest right here in front of the show creator? Maybe he'll make Thanks. them happen. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, one of the things I loved about Ian was that and it's it's not always an easy thing to play, but that he's got really good intentions. Now, he is essentially a good man. He might make mistakes. He might make terrible mistakes. He might um, do things which he feels are for the best interest. But essentially, he's a good man. I think not in terms of a religious way, but you know, he has good he has good Christian values, if you want. You know, he does put himself. He has empathetic values. He puts himself in the shoes of other people. And I think that is part of one of the things uh, that I feel is quite lacking at the moment is the idea of ourselves as a humanity that has values that are empathetic about what must it be like for those other people to look at how other people are living their life and struggling in their life and have uh, our ears open and our hearts open to that, as opposed to the, f the fear that we're given 
and we're governed by fear that closes our hearts and closes our ears and our minds to other people's plights. That's beautiful. My heart's open to everything you just said, though my clock is now saying we can't uh, <laughs> we can't talk about it anymore. Uh, so James Graham, David Morrissey, thank you both for joining us. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And thanks to all of you for tuning in today at Post Live. To check out what interviews we have coming up, head to WashingtonPostLive.com to find more. I'm Dave Jorgensen, and thank you for joining us at Washington Post Live.